Coming up, an interview with the lawyer representing more than 100 victims of Sean Diddy Combs, some of whom were underage. It seems not a moment goes by without another very disturbing allegation against the music impresario Sean Diddy Combs, now being accused by Homeland Security and federal prosecutors of operating a major human trafficking and sex exploitation ring. And Tony Busby, who's a lawyer based in Houston, Texas, represents now more than 100 survivors, victims, allegedly, of Diddy. And Mr. Busby joins me now from Houston. Sir, thank you for being with us today. Glad to be here, Chris. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Uh, disturbed by all this, though, we've been investigating predators for for decades now, and, and I'm at a loss to describe an alleged case this big, this violent, uh, and this disturbing. How do you get your arms around representing more than 100 alleged victims, survivors and, and of the, one man? It, it's difficult. It's obviously very administrative intensive. Um, you know, you have to treat each one of these cases on its own merit. Um, we've received at this point 3,500 calls of people who either claim to be victimized by Sean Combs or have information they want to share about him, some sort of interaction they had with him and things that they saw. Um, so it's very tough. You know, we have about 90 people who are attempting to vet these claims on, on the front end. And then uh, we have retired Houston police officers, including people that were in the major crimes unit here, who are assisting us in running down witnesses, collecting texts, pictures, video, that sort of thing. Uh, we want to make sure, you know, because it's such a high profile case, uh, because there's, there's a lot of media attention, we want to make sure that it, that it's done by the numbers and done correctly. So, you know, we've been working on this uh, probably for six months. Uh, obviously, after the indictment and and specifically after Sean Combs's bail was denied for the second time, I think, you know, that kind of opened the floodgates. I think people are very, very fearful of, of Sean Combs and his, his entourage. You know, he's perceived to be, uh, you know, uh, connected with some sort of criminal element on the one hand, but also very friendly with people who in power and also with other celebrities. So um, he's, he's very quick. Uh, these victims will tell you that, that when they would cry out or complain about certain things, he would be very quick to, to make these either uh, explicit threats or, or implicit threats about you know, them speaking to anyone about the conduct that they had seen or been involved in. So, you know, the flood I think you raise a critical point here, Mr. Busby, in that one of the reasons his bail was denied was because of this allegation of violent witness tampering. Yeah. And, and now that he's clearly going to be held without bail, based upon what we've seen in the courts in, in New York, it would seem that a lot of these victims would feel safe coming forward. But it speaks to the violence alleged in these allegations. Yeah, I mean, there, there's... There are some of these victims that were on the receiving end of some very, you know, not, not implicit, but very direct violence against them. Um, but, you know, there's an M.O. here uh, when you when you when you get, look at the range of these cases and what what has been alleged, uh, you kind of see an overwhelming thing, which is, you know, he identifies somebody that, that he wants to either have sexual contact with or he wants his cohorts to have sexual contact with. Uh, the, they, they are ultimately drugged in some way, typically through a drink, and then um, they end up, you know, being murky, not understanding what's going on, and wake up the next morning, in some cases, without their clothes or shoes, uh, confused, injured, and not knowing what to do. Um, that is a reoccurring theme. Um, and so how this was able to go on for so long, it's, it's, it's hard to fathom, because we know that that a lot of this conduct occurred um, at at you know venues, whether it be hotels, clubs, after parties, uh, famous people's homes, um, you know, publicized parties that that are all over the internet. We can see that the clips from them, and and if you look at interviews that that people that attended the party when they get to the point of asking about certain things. 
that would kind of get close to some of the conduct we're talking about, you know, they go quiet. Um, so this was a secret in the industry that everyone knew about. And I'm just very proud that, that you know, that the, the chips have started to fall. You know, the Cassie case, I think, was, was kind of the beginning of this. And then the, the investigation and then the, the indictment and then the arrest and then the bail being denied. And now people are coming forward. In fact, we published a, a phone number for a, a abuse hotline yesterday and it, it literally crashed. We had so many calls. So we have a great task in front of us of trying to sift through uh, whether these folks who are calling are victims or have information or just, you know, you obviously you know that in these types of situations, there's people that just call for, you know, and crank and that sort of thing. We have to sift through that and we're going to do that. But I expect we'll start filing uh, cases in, in New York federal court in the next two weeks to 30 days. And I expect we're going to be joining uh, defendants in these cases that are going to raise some eyebrows. Um, and uh, I look forward to, you know, following this evidence wherever it goes. And whoever Which begs the question, Mr. Busby, uh, and you bring up a, a, one of the points that uh, intrigues me and a lot of other people so much is that other people in the music industry had to know, perhaps even cover up, and as you may allege in the future, have taken a role in allowing Combs to do this. Hey everyone, Chris Hansen here. We have almost 100 new episodes on my streaming crime network, WatchTrueBlue.com. Use the code YouTube24 for half off your first month, or YouTube year for $20 off a full year. We'll see you soon on True Blue. It's, it's my view that if you were in the room, a minor's in the room being abused and you allowed it to happen, you have liability. It's my view that if you that if you facilitated or egged that on in some way, you have liability. It's my view that you if you provided the venue, knowing how he was and the things that he was doing, along with the, the people that he was that he was with, you have liability. It's my view that if that if that if you knew as a hotel owner that he was renting out an entire floor and there were people appearing, multiple people, young women and young men who were appearing at the front desk and you were not taking down their name and you were sending them directly to his floor you have liability. It's my view that if you're a bank and you knew that he was withdrawing hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash that was being used to pay for people to be shipped from all across the country as uh, and trafficked, you have liability. I mean, I think the the facets of this uh, and, you know, everybody's really tuned into, you know, who are the celebrities that might be named. But in my view, um, the more sinister, the more sinister element of this is all the corporations that benefited from this, and the venues that benefited from this, and and the people that profited from this culture that he created. And I look forward to peeling back every layer of that onion so we can all see what was going on here. And there is precedent for this. J.P. Morgan Chase was held liable in the Epstein case, as I'm sure you know, and in human trafficking cases around the country. Hotel chains, major companies have been held responsible for allowing this sort of human trafficking activity to occur on their properties. Yeah, we, we know we know from the, the victims that that, you know, that it was routine for for the, the so-called atmosphere. They had what they called atmosphere girls uh, who would be shipped in, uh, pay ten thousand dollars per person um, to be there and then coerced and, and bullied and some cases forced to do certain things that they didn't anticipate that they were supposed to be doing and then held there, uh, not allowed to leave. I mean, there, this is the kind of thing that was going on. It was going on at the same time that, that a lot of people, they were taking pictures. It's going on like literally right, you know, right next to them. And some of the same pictures that you see on Instagram and other social media uh, platforms, uh, I think this is going to be, a, you know, even bigger than people can imagine. Um, Give me a sense of the volume of videotape and photographic evidence and recordings you have. We are still sifting through hundreds of pictures and video. You know, some of it, it's without context. It's hard to even know uh, what, what this even means or what's, you know, how does this fit into the picture? We've been, I've been sent just unsolicited via email and direct message on social media, videos and pictures and stuff. So we're trying to sift through all that. So I couldn't even give you an estimate. Um, you know, yesterday there was there was an individual who, of course, uh, did not want to reveal who she was, but was texting me 
you just video after video after video from some of these so-called freak offs. And I'm just looking at this stuff like, man, I wish this weren't on my phone. Number one. And number two, she was texting you on your personal phone. Yeah. Videos yeah. of these freak offs. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what does that say to you that somebody unsolicited feels so strongly about what's happened to her and others that she would send this material to you? Yeah. And, and I'm trying to, and here I am trying to figure out, first off, you know, I, <laughs> I don't want this stuff on my phone, but laying out. No. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the context, like who, who, who is, who are these people doing these things that you would, you know, you would typically wouldn't, wouldn't see. And obviously you couldn't, couldn't show it to anybody in public. It's pretty, pretty graphic, but, but I, you know, I've had, you know, we have this large team of people trying to field all these calls and all these media or this uh, internet contact and um, you know, trying to sift through that and, and, and screen that and get people to the next level to start talking to lawyers and and the difficulty, as you might expect, is what you want to do is you want to you want to make sure that people believe like, look, you are believed. OK, we believe victims. We're not going to we're not going to we're not here to cross examine you at this point. We're not here to to to, you know, to, to be skeptical. But at some point we have to be because, as you know, these are very difficult cases. These are these these are difficult cases going against a, a powerful group of people. So at some point, you know, when they get to the third level, hard questions have to be asked. And so we're, 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 there's a balance we have to cut here. We have to, on the one hand, make sure that people understand that we believe you. We want to hear what you have to say. We want to hear your story. We want to represent you and help you if we can. On the other hand, you need to understand that this is, this is not going to be a cakewalk. You know, this is, this is going to be, there's going to be a lot of attention on this and they're going to fight, fight us tooth and nail. And the first defense is going to be, we never don't know who you are and you're just here to try to get money. And the second defense is, well, if you've proven that we were in the same room together, but we didn't do anything to you. And the entire defense is going to be, we're going to attack your character and your lawyer's character. And we're going to attack, you know, from the very beginning. So this is, I've been down this road before. It's a, it's a difficult road, but the, the fact that we have 120 people who are willing to step forward, who have been vetted now and are, and are, ready and willing and able to file their case. We're going to file them under the Jane Doe or the John Doe uh, pseudonym, but we understand that eventually their names will be made public. I'm encouraging them to talk to the Homeland Security and the FBI. Um, I'm encouraging them to allow me to share their names and their information with the authorities. I'm encouraging them that at some point, let's, let's step in front of a camera and let's tell your story because there's probably a, a many, many other people out there who, if they see you on the camera and they hear what you have to say and it happened to them, they'll step forward too. So that's kind of where we are in this. And, you know, we're at the tip of the iceberg. How many of your victims, uh, Mr. Busby, were underage, were minors at the time of the offenses? 25 of the 120. 25? 25. We're talking about, and, and you would think that we're talking about females, but we're, we're you would be... I was surprised because I, I just expected this was all, these were all females, but, but of the 120 people, half are males and of the minors, about half are males as well. Uh, we have a, a, a young man who was nine years old at the time this occurred. Nine years old, Mr. Buzz. Nine years old, 13 years old, 14 years old, a 15 year old. Uh, all of these are, are with one exception, young men who were trying to break into the industry the nine-year-old young man was 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 essentially his parents responded to some sort of advertisements. Somebody was recruiting young people to break into the industry, and he he made the various screening uh, mechanisms they had. And him, along with four other boys, went and were able to meet uh, Sean Combs. And his his parents essentially handed him off to Sean Combs. And they they alleged that they handed him off and, and Sean Combs had had his way with this child by coercing him and, and pressuring him and promising him things. And, you know, to the point now that that, you know, just devastated this this young man's life who, you know, he doesn't want to have anything to do with music. I mean, it was his dream to be a musician, he doesn't want to have anything to do with music. Of course, his parents are have shame and guilt for, because they helped facilitate that. And that's kind of a, a typical story of what we're talking about here. And uh, I think I think it goes without saying that, and it shouldn't be this way, but it is this way, that that uh, it's even more difficult for a, for a young man to come forward uh, when this happens to him, it, you know, because there is a stigma involved in that. So uh, this is what we're dealing with and at the same time trying to be sensitive 
uh, you know, we've got to be aggressive and pursue the case and make sure we leave no stone unturned and we gather all the evidence and we ask the hard questions of the clients. But at the other hand, on the other hand, we have to be sensitive because th this is tough stuff. And this this young man's been living with this for a long time. I can't imagine the shame, the degradation, the absolute destruction of a child's life being exposed to this at the age of nine. You think about, you know, this at the time this happened, this allegedly happened. Sean Combs was the top of the top of the music industry. It was well known that if he if he liked you, he could make you a star. And that's what the parents were excited about. And obviously, the young man was excited about. And then this this happens. You know, it's like he's just on the, the uh, scrap heap of history, if you will, you know, just devastates. And I don't want to be too pessimistic because my, my hope is that the young man has a, a long, productive life. But but boy, it's hard when something like this happens to you. In terms of predatory behavior, you've investigated victims whom you've represented. Where does this case rank, Mr. Busby? A lot of the, the cases that I've had, the conduct has been secret, private. There were some suspicions, but it was private. And it was usually one person on one person. Um, and of course, you know, when you have this uh, predilection like this, it happens over and over. You know, it doesn't just happen once. Typically, when something like this happens, you can you can bet that it's probably happened more than once. What's what's different about this case, in my view, is that is that this was not a secret. I mean, some of this behavior was happening in the presence, and I'm not just talking about in the presence because Sean Combs never went anywhere without bodyguards, never went anywhere, never traveled anywhere without some sort of entourage or posse, if you will. Um, and certainly those people knew what he was up to and knew what his, his um, inclinations were. Um, but what's, what's more disturbing about this is, is that at some of these, these after parties weren't just four or five people. These after parties were people that knew that about one o'clock, you know, there was going to be a shift in this party and things were going to be different. You know, this was not going to be, you know, the party that you see on the on Instagram and so forth. I mean, some of the conduct occurred during the main party, but the, the, the most sinister conduct occurred in the so-called after parties. And those were not small affairs. And so you wonder, you have people of note, people who are, are known who attended some of these and knew about some of some of this behavior going on. I mean, there was no secret that people were being flown in. I mean, there's no way you could you could not know that unless you were just I mean, there's just no way you could not know that. And and the things that were going on in the presence of people that of names that we've all heard in venues that we all know in people's homes that we all know and how it went on for for 25 or more years without anybody saying anything. You know, you've heard some celebrities say, hey, I would never go to a Diddy party. There's there's a there's a group of celebrities out there who are making that more and more well known because obviously what's going on. Um, but how did this go on for so long without anyone saying, you know, enough is enough of this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak out about this. Uh, you know, I know he's a powerful person. I know he's connected with with some powerful people. I know that, you know, Politically, he's even connected, and maybe there's an element of some sort of criminal element here that, that could be a danger. But I'm going to say something because what I'm seeing is not correct. It's not right, and I don't want to be a part of it, and I don't want to be associated with it. But you never heard that. You know, you heard people like Cat Williams who have said some things years back. You know, um, um, 50 Cent has said some things about, about that. You know, you've heard interviews here and there about when people ask about uh, – Sean Combs' parties, you know, they, they grow silent and they kind of, it's kind of hush, hush. I can't talk about that. Uh, but why didn't they ever say something? You know, why did they allow this to happen and continue to happen? It's my view that if you continue to attend those parties, knowing what was going on and not saying anything, how are you not, how are you not complicit in some way? Do you uh, have witnesses, insiders who are willing to cooperate in this case? I think so. I, I, I also think that certainly have witnesses who saw this, who weren't involved, but are willing, who have nothing to gain, who are willing to talk. 
I expect that some of the, the, the people that were the closest to Sean Combs, uh, who are with him at all times, will probably talk. I think, you know, the federal government is really good, as you know, at getting people who are not the targets to talk. Uh, I expect that'll happen. I expect the indictment and the charges in the indictment will grow. Uh, I expect that other people will be implicated. Um, so I, I think that, like I say, I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg here. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm what I'm most interested in is, is every single person who is victimized come forward and come forward now. You know, there's a reason that, that, that New York State and California have very long statutes of limitation for these types of crimes because people are very, very, you know, if they don't cry out immediately, then it gets harder and harder as time passes for them to come forward because they're going to be the first thing people say is, why didn't you come out immediately? Because a lot of people don't understand how hard it is to say, hey, this person did this to me because it's a, they don't, there may be financial repercussions, safety concerns, family repercussions, backlash from their community. You know, people can be, you know, there's a reason for this, you know, this word fan is short for fanatics. Um, and people are, can be really mean and nasty. And when you're dealing with a, a you know, alleged criminal element, you know, uh, people should there's fear. Blowback. For, yeah, there's blowback. And, you know, even for me, you know, I've have been, you know, you can only imagine, I'm sure for you too, the kind of, the kind of messages you get on social media of people, they're going to do this to you and they're going to do that or to your wife. And, you know, I've had, my wife told me last night, you know, we're going to have to get, cause I have security at my house, but we're going to have to, you're going to have to have 24 hour security. I'm thinking, come on, you know, you, you know, that's just a bunch of foolishness, but, but who knows? I'm, um, well, it's you know, real. I, I've seen it personally, you know, and you're out there trying to do the right thing and expose evil actors. And, you know, there can be blowback from those people yeah. and their associates. There's no question. Yeah. What, uh, before I let you go, Mr. Busby, and I know you're a busy fellow. One last question. What does this say about this particular segment of the music industry that, as you have said and has been proved, look the other way on this. I, I call it the, you know, the, the facilitators, you know, obviously the people that participated in this are, are terrible, it's terrible actions and terrible conduct and, and should be prosecuted and put underneath the jail. But, you know, what really irks me are the people that that saw this happening, that enjoyed enjoyed themselves while it was happening, that that fancied themselves as upstanding people and knew this was happening and continued to go to these parties knowing this was going to happen, and that were, in my view, are just as complicit. And and whether they you know they can be criminally charged or even civilly sued, these people should know know that they knew and they didn't do anything about it. Tony Busby from Houston. Thank you very much for spending all this time and taking us inside this investigation. I promise you we will stay in touch and we will continue our work on our end as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chris.